Nana, thank you for your introduction. I almost did not recognize myself at a certain point. Permit me, Nana, <clears throat> to begin by expressing my appreciation to the President, the Executive Committee, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. Unquote. For those non-Christians amongst you, that's from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. But it is not an introduction to a sermon. So why did Joseph and Mary undertake this long journey? Because, Nana, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it was considered important in those days Jesus was born, my friends. They knew that the numbers counted. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and friends, and fellow students. Thomas Malthus, an English gentleman, cleric, demographer, and economist, was the first person to draw attention to the fact that there was a correlation between population size and caused the production of the means of survival, in this case, food production, increased arithmetically, while the size of the population grew geometrically, unless there were what he termed preventive and positive checks. A point would be reached when population growth would outstrip food supply. Famine and death would ensue. His prediction, fortunately, based on the agrarian economy of the England of his day, did not materialize because he did not foresee the positive impact on food availability as a result of improvements in farm management and the application of new technologies, such as improved seeds and reductions in post-harvest losses. The Malthusian theory, however, established the need and practice of integrating population dynamics into development planning. What happens when we fail to take the numbers into account in our decision making. And now we come from the sublime to the mundane. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I live in East Legon. Many of you, I dare say, know the tunnel which connects the Shiachi Boundary Road in East Legon to the Spintex Road. Under normal traffic conditions, it takes me about five minutes to drive from my house to the tunnel. During the rush hour, however, particularly when early in the morning, when parents drop their children at school, it could take me anything up to an hour. That was before a new tunnel was built to ease the traffic congestion during peak hours. The new tunnel was officially commissioned with the usual fanfare several months ago. So, what has happened? The congestion got worse. It now takes me sometimes no less than an hour to get to the tunnel from my house during rush hour. I do believe that the new tunnel was planned and executed by appropriate and competent authority 
with the best intentions for the benefit of the people who have to use the tunnel every day. And so, you may ask, what went wrong? The simple answer is that the planets did not make the numbers count. <clears throat> this tunnel was conceived as an engineering project without taking into consideration the steadily increasing volume of vehicular traffic, even during, quote unquote, that the volume of traffic was already increasing even during normal hours. But they didn't. By failing to make the numbers count <clears throat> and a significant cost to the taxpayer and to the frustration of the intended beneficiaries, the planners have succeeded in making an existing bad situation worse. This evening, I wish to present a case of personal and political capital as well as the participation and commitment of stakeholders, including beneficiaries. These prerequisites, however, Nana Chairman, do not in and of themselves, in isolation or together, necessarily secure or guarantee desired outcomes. Sentiment and good intentions are no substitutes for rigorous data-based planning. To achieve their goals, it is critical that serious and conscientious efforts are made to ensure that the planning, execution, and evaluation of such programs are firmly based on the realities on the ground, the numbers, and evidence before our eyes. We need to develop and strengthen a culture of database planning for development. We must count the numbers. Any social development policy, program, or intervention should begin with a critical question. Who are the primary beneficiaries or targets of this intervention? What are their numbers, ages, sex, special distribution, levels of education, special needs, etc., etc., or the population to be specifically targeted to achieve desired outcomes? It is also pertinent to address the issue of research requirements from the beginning. In so doing, one must take into consideration the potential contribution of beneficiaries. Elizabeth Anderson, Adamson, 1937, is credited with a quip, a baby is an elementary canal with a loud mouth at one end and no sense of responsibility at the other. From a development policy perspective, however, it is significant to note that this alimentary canal arrives with two legs, a pair of hands, and a brain. Development is first and foremost about, for, and by people. The people, therefore, are not only the beneficiaries of development or consumers, but also the agents, initiators, and drivers of development. A good reason, Nana, why their numbers count. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in the past two decades, Ghana has invested heavily in several major programs with the goals of achieving social transformation. These programs or social intervention strategies include the National Health Insurance Scheme, 
and free maternity services, the Ghana Education Trust Fund, and free basic education, which now includes free senior high school, the school feeding program, and the livelihood empowerment against poverty or LEAP, and a range of other interventions at reducing extreme poverty. These interventions were based on a vision of a society in which every child was protected against the ravages of childhood disease and early death from bacteria, diarrhea, or malnutrition, where every pregnant woman received care and attention she needed to avoid untimely death or long-term complications such as obstetric fistula where the elderly received affordable social and health care. It included the right of every child <clears throat> to basic education and the opportunity to achieve his or her full potential of transforming our society within a generation or two, provided that effort matched expectations. In the year 2000, <clears throat> the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Millennium Development Goals. In 2015, these goals were reviewed and refined, and the ideals and concepts and strategies embodied in the SDGs provide a broad framework for Ghana's social transformation programs and interventions. No, no. It is probably too early <clears throat> for an objective impact assessment of these social intervention strategies. Undoubtedly, some progress has been made and to deliver in health facilities. School enrollment ladies and gentlemen, is up. Thousands of children now have at least one square meal a day, thanks to the school feeding program. And LEAP has lifted thousands of families out of dehumanizing poverty. But it has been predicted and avoided. I would like now to take a like us now to take a look at a few of these programs and see if we can identify the challenges they faced and how these could have been addressed. Let us start with the basic education, including free senior high school. This important sector is basic schools. 8,850 junior high schools and 900 senior high schools, including the private ones in the country. If media reports are correct, there is a severe infrastructure deficit in the end times. The majority of senior high schools are overcrowded and their dormitories are completely full. Last month, as schools reopened, we were all greeted on social media with the news that hundreds of new hopeful students had been turned back at Mfansipin School. Similar harrowing scenes as hundreds of students Parents and guardians from almost every corner of this country gathered to find out if they had secured admission into any, but preferably their choice of senior high school under the free senior high school program. Undoubtedly, other factors, including technical problems with the computerized school selection and placement system and poor communication contributed to the ensuing chaos. 
But, Nana, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, regardless of where one stands on the issue of the free senior high school program, the underlying and inescapable fact was that there were not enough places in the right schools where parents and guardians wished to send their children. Let us count the numbers. No, no. Between 2005 and 2019, the number of BEC candidates who qualified for placement in senior high schools had more than doubled from 177,000 to 490,000 without corresponding increases in the number of places or facilities. Many of the challenges faced on the first day of school this year and the frustrations and distress that many Ghanaian families experience could and should have been foreseen and possibly those who have eyes to see. The number of new students the University of Ghana can admit each year partly depends on the number of students it can accommodate in its halls of residence and off-campus residential facilities. The total number of rooms available and the number of students per room are known. These numbers should be used as the basis for determining how many undergraduates can be offered residential accommodation each year. Let the numbers count. The National Health Insurance Scheme, I see the chairman is sitting right to my left here, was set up in 2003 to provide equitable access and financial coverage for basic health care, for basic health care services, and, I quote, achieving universal coverage within five years, unquote, now faces a crisis of confidence among key stakeholders, difficulties in enrollment and retention, and funding. One study reported in 2018 found the national, that the National Health Insurance Scheme was implemented within an overburdened healthcare system without adequate resources to handle the growing number of participants. The crushing pressure on hospital outpatient departments and wards, the near empty shelves in hospital pharmacies and dispensaries, the frustrations of health service providers struggling to pose to cope with increasing numbers of National Health Insurance card holders seeking medical attention were predictable. The numbers of civil service delivery points and personnel were already known. If these numbers, which are readily available within the health sector, been taken into account, the rollout of the National Health Insurance Scheme could have been phased out so that available resources could be more effectively targeted at pressure points in the system. Ladies and gentlemen, the goal of, I quote again, achieving universal coverage within five years is not only too vague, but it's too difficult to evaluate because the goalposts keep moving as the population grows every year. The planners could have set more specific key performance indicators, such as reaching maybe 100,000 new recruits each year for the next five years. This would have made it easier to evaluate progress each year and adapt strategies accordingly. Let's look at the issue of unemployment. Nana, 
without doubt. Unemployment remains one of the most serious developmental challenges facing the country. This is due partly to the perceived pervasiveness of the problem, the segment of the population most affected, and the potential risks to national security, peace, and stability. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this is one subject area where hard facts are particularly difficult to find. Several agencies and institutions collect unemployment data based on their peculiar needs. This includes the ministries, trade union congress, as well as, well as various academic and research institutions. Earlier this month, the Minister of Employment and Labor Relations put the unemployment rate in, in Ghana at 7.1% of the labor force. By some accounts, 80% of the labor force are engaged in the informal sector. 67% of working people are employed in the private sector and only 28.5% in the public sector. According to the Ghana Living Standards Survey report of 2008, the lack of a solid database has resulted in a rather weak and fragmented national response to this serious problem. At the last count, in addition to three ministries led by the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, there are at least four government agencies, namely the National Youth Authority, the National Youth Employment Agency, the Youth Employment Support Program, and now sector. Shouldn't the focus of government efforts be directed to addressing issues in that sector? I would like at this point to take you through some of the salient features of Ghana's population profile, which I think are pertinent to our discussions. Ghana's population has grown from 6.7 million in 1960 to an estimated 30 million in 2019. In other words, during the past 59 years, the population of Ghana has grown by more than four and a half times. Currently, the population is estimated to be growing at the rate of 2.5%, which means that the total population of Ghana will reach 45 million by the year 2040. Ghana has a youthful population. Young people aged 25 years or below constituted 58.3% of the total population in 2010. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Ghanaians are no longer village dwellers in rural areas. According to a report by the Ghana Statistical Services, based on figures from the 2010 Population and Housing Census, by 2017, more than half, that is 55.41% of Ghanaians were living in towns and cities. Greater Accra alone already has over 4 million people making it the 11th largest metro area in Africa. Urbanization is increasing at the rate of 3.07% per annum due to both natural increase and rural urban migration. The report also found that one third of urban dwellers did not have access to portable water and only 25% of households had access 
to water closet. Ladies and gentlemen, do these numbers count? What are the implications of these numbers on urban planning, housing, waste disposal, and the environment? Can we ignore these numbers in planning our medium and long-term national development strategies and programs? Let us now turn our attention to the sources of data for development planning. In Ghana, the main demographic data are captured in decennial population and housing censuses, as well as from the National Demographic Sample Service, such as the Ghana Demographic and Health Service, that are periodically organized in the country. Ghana has conducted population and housing census every 10 years since 2000. Currently, preparations for the 2020 population and housing census are ongoing to provide the country with an update of the demographic situation with new indicators for planning. The Ghana Statistical Services is the government institution mandated to collect, collate, assess, and disseminate official statistics in Ghana. This mandate includes collaboration and coordination with ministries, departments, and agencies, and other statistical organizations to compile data critical for the planning and management or agency collect data relevant to its mandate and operations. Principal among these are the Ministries of Health, Ministry of Education, the, and the Ghana Education Service, the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. Other agencies collecting data including, include the Ghana Immigration Service and the Electoral Commission. In the context of our discussions this evening, the National Development Planning Commission, or NDPC, ranks among the most important institutions in Ghana. Established under Articles 86 and 87 of the 1992 Constitution, its core mandate, as we have recently been reminded, is, and I quote, to advise the President on development planning policy and strategies. Among other functions, the NDPC makes proposals for the development of multi-year rolling plans, taking into consideration the resource potential and comparative advantage of the different districts of Ghana. In discharging its mandate, the NDPC relies heavily on data from a wide variety of sources, including the Ghana Statistical Services, MDAs, academic and research institutions, as well as its own studies. The NDPC has the responsibility to ensure not only that relevant information is collected, but that it is efficiently processed, analyzed, and consciously integrated into the development planning process at all stages. It must also facilitate the sharing of information and the transfer of the necessary skills for integrating population variables into development planning at all levels. Let us also include the National Identification Authority, NIA, which was established under the National Identity Register Act 2008, Act 707, and is mandated to register all Ghanaians to, to create and maintain a national identity base. In the medium to long term, this authority should become a major source of demographic and social data for development planning. 
Let me now turn to the civil registration and vital statistics. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, established more than a hundred years ago, the civil registration and vital statistics and information system in Ghana remains underdeveloped and underutilized due to lack of awareness and compliance. It is almost impossible to overstate the critical contribution that a well-functioning system of registering births and deaths can make towards developing a national database for development planning. The Ghana Shared Growth and Development Agenda 2014 to 2017 states, and I quote, and I quote that it considers the quality and completeness of vital events registration and associated services to be critical for evidence-based decision-making. The Births and Deaths Registry is currently poorly resourced. Although it has staff in almost every district in the country and collects mountains of important data, it does not publish any regular reports. Nana, Chair, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Ghana has made remarkable progress in evolving several important social intervention policies and programs to enhance the quality of life of its population. It is apparent, however, that where the conception, planning, development, and implementation of these programs had not been adequately informed by the socio-demographic data, which in this lecture had been defined literally and figuratively to facilitate the process. I wish to recommend that priority be given to improving access to reliable data by investing in the creation of a full-fledged national database, preferably within the Ghana Statistical Services. It will be much cheaper to maintain one comprehensive database than several parallel ones. I further recommend that the civil registration and vital statistics information system be strengthened through adequate funding and technical assistance to enable it discharge its important mandate. The key role of the National Population Council is to coordinate the activities of several government agencies and research institutions involved in collecting and processing demographic data and to facilitate the dissemination and access to relevant data for planning purposes. It also has the mandate to assist in training personnel in the integration of demographic variables into the development process. The National Population Council must, above all, strongly advocate or support advocacy for the creation of a national database and improved access to quality data for development planning. As I said before, a huge amount of data is collected and stored on a regular basis by a host of agencies. The problem is that the majority of institutions, agencies, and individuals collecting data seem unaware of the value of the information they gather or, the, or how that information can be used for planning purposes or for improving performance and outcomes. If aware, the staff seem to lack the skills to use the data for planning. Awareness, ladies and gentlemen, is important. Acquiring the skills for integration is key. Staff at all levels, especially those involved in policy formulation and planning, 
should be properly trained for the purpose. I therefore wish to recommend that a training module be established at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, GIMPA, for that purpose. This will require active participation and collaboration among key stakeholders, including the Ministry of Planning, Ghana Statistical Services, the National Development Planning Commission, the Regional Institute for Population Studies, and the National Population Council. Nana, a lot of effort is being made by many agencies to collect data. Much of this effort needs to be better coordinated. We may have issues about the relevance, completeness, or quality of some of the information available. But what we can say is that at least some of the numbers are being counted. We have greater concerns about how much use is made of the numbers available for policy formulation, strategy development, and decision making with respect to development planning. There are issues around awareness, capacity, and skills for the integration of social and demographic variables into development planning. I have made a couple of recommendations to deal with some of these challenges and consequences that we face in making the numbers count. But, Nanache, ladies and gentlemen, a more fundamental question remains. Where and how far do we as a nation wish to go in making the numbers count? What price are we willing and able to pay to get there? Thank you, Nana Chair, for your patience and endurance. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and kindness.